My mother wanted my sister and I baptized in the Catholic Church, but my father did not. He asked us to wait till we were old enough to choose which religion we wished to follow. My lack of baptism really bothered my mother, but it actually made me very interested in God. My mother's faith intrigued me. She um, had such deep faith. Generally, my younger sister Rita would go to the Unitarian services with my dad while I joined my mom at Mass. I was drawn to God, and especially to the Blessed Mother. I remember after middle school, walking down to St. Bernard's Church to pray in front of the statue of our Blessed Mother. At that time, I didn't know what was drawing me, but I knew I felt safe and loved and at peace. I chose to be a Roman Catholic at the age of 14 and receive the sacraments of baptism, confirmation, and Holy Eucharist all in one day. <laughs> Two years later, my father died of cancer, and his, birth, his death spurred me to study nursing and continue to draw me to God. After graduating from high school, I went to the University of New Hampshire, where we were blessed by the presence of our chaplain, a father, Vincent Wallace. He was born with a deformed hand and nearly denied ordination due to that deformity. He truly gave glory to God. He was amazing. I was fed spiritually through his homilies and folk masses throughout my college years and started to consider religious life or the Peace Corps, but I lacked the courage. At the same time, I met my husband, John, and grew a relationship with him. He pursued me. We spent more and more time together studying, going to folk mass, conversing, and dreaming together. Father Wallace married us on August 14, 1971. He died less than a year later in front of the altar in his church of a massive heart attack. But I'll never forget his deep faith in goodness. He surely fanned that budding flame of faith in me throughout my college years. John and I couldn't afford a honeymoon, so we put our wedding gifts in the new hall attached to our secondhand red comet and headed west to Iowa for him to go to medical school. It was in Iowa that I became a community health nurse, doing maternity and newborn counseling to unwed teenage mothers when I knew nothing of motherhood myself. I really had no idea what a life altering blessing mother would be for me. All I knew is I hoped we could have a child. I did go to weekly mass, but otherwise did nothing particular to pursue my faith. But God pursued me. Our son Jim was the oldest of our five children. And except for my first year of sleepless nights that many of us have adored with the newborns. Jim was such a joy. He was a happy child, curious about the world and people. He loved books. He loved to be read to. Bible stories, history, fantasy. He had quite an imagination, loving to pretend to be the heroes or saints we read about. I can still see him in our Texas backyard with his coonskin cap pretending to be Davy Crockett at the Alamo. He and his brother Michael had so many adventures together. But one distinctive attribute of Jim's was his big heart and welcoming way of everyone. Even as a little boy, he had a kindness about him, which I totally took for granted. He was easygoing, made friends easily. Grew up in the Catholic Church, serving as an altar boy from the age of 10, but was not particularly religious. Perhaps he was a lot like your sons and daughters. He was fun-loving, hard-working, well-liked, and like many teens, gave us quite a few great years. 
He loved to explore, he was very interested, as I said, in people and cultures. Uh, he was quite a, quite a child. In 1978, I was drawn to go on a Perseo weekend retreat. A uh, weekend course in Christianity, which originated in Spain and now is now worldwide. You may well know. And Christio for me was such a moving experience of God's closeness. I became hungrier to know God and his love for me. I remember being drawn to more frequent Mass and daily reading of the scripture. Mass became a place of refuge, a sacred stillness where my mind and soul were fed with the Word of God and the Eucharist. <clears throat> it was a safe place where God nurtured me and fanned out my new Christ within me. After medical school, um, John joined the Army Medical Corps, and we traveled quite a bit in the country, meeting different, very diverse, interesting folks, and I grew in faith. But when his term with heart was done, he wanted to return to New Hampshire and chose a tiny lakeside community of Wolfboro. Well, inside, I really resisted. I didn't want to go to such a remote place. They didn't even have a movie there. <laughs> I, I remember thinking, I remember asking God to help me to find him, even there. God answered my prayer in abundance. By then, we had three young sons whom I wanted to know God in their lives. So I was challenged to prepare our parish children for First Holy Communion. I suspect, I know, I learned so much more than they did. I just came to realize how much God yearns to feed us, to nurture us, how he continually offers his strength and hope for our journey. If we but listen, at that time in New Hampshire, we also had an office of renewal led by a very charismatic dear friend and priest who became my spiritual director and the godfather to our youngest child and only daughter, Kate. I had the um, blessing of serving on the Christian team and joined a weekly prayer group. The devout women in my prayer group were older than I and so patient Te um, about teaching about God's goodness and God's compassion. Week after week, as we re reflect on the upcoming Sunday readings together, it's just a real time of learning for me and growing in the Lord. So those 13 years spent in the little town of Wolfboro were truly filled with God nurturing and strengthening me. But while I was enjoying being a mother and growing in my faith, my husband, John, was working non-stop. He was the only internal medicine physician in our town of 15,000 that mushroomed to a summer population of over 35 to 40,000. While I enjoyed taking our five kiddos to the lake for picnics and swimming, John was working day and night. And we started to grow apart. Marriage Encounter, a weekend retreat for marriages, allowed a brief respite. But gradually, we continued to lead more and more separate lives. In 1993, John announced he wanted to move south to a larger city and medical center. So he began commuting south for work, while I was left in Wolfburg to care for our children and our home. John became irritable with me when he was home. And I really didn't know what was going on inside of him. We went to marriage counseling to no avail. But finally, we went on a retrobiotic weekend. I don't know if any of you have heard about it, but it's a Catholic weekend for troubled marriages. And our surely was becoming troubled. The weekend focused on communication, God's love, and weekly follow-up sessions. And gradually, our daily communication began to heal our marriage. Rosary 
the holy rosary, the rosary, became my constant companion. When I was lonely or anxious, afraid, or just had time, it accompanied me on walks, on drives. It helped me to relax and to trust, to remind myself that the Lord was with me. I learned the Divine Mercy Chaplet on a pilgrimage to Medjugorje in 1994. And the more I prayed the Rosary and Divine Mercy Chaplet, the more I felt God's hope and light growing within me. I felt a deep assurance that God was with me. You know, was, God was preparing me day by day and step by step ever so gently inviting me to come closer, to sit for a while, be refreshed. Many days as a young mother, um, Matthew 1, 28 would speak to me, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And then when bigger problems developed, the 24th Psalm reassured me God was with me in the dark valley, leading me by green, by quiet waters, refreshing my soul, and guiding me along the right paths for his name's sake. But little did I know how much I would need him in my darkest valley that began in Lent of 2011, when our oldest son Jim was kidnapped while working as an independent conflict journalists in Libya. We were in shock. Our three youngest um, kids at the time were serving in the military, and I'd been praying, you know, so worried about them. I hadn't thought about Jim being at risk. I had no idea journalists took risks to bring us the news. The solemn Lenten scriptures embraced me and strengthened my awareness of a deep connection through prayer to Jim, even though he was thousands of miles away in Tripoli. I spent hours in prayer, and those hours made me feel so close to Jim. His living captivity only lasted 44 days, but at that time we were plunged into a deep panic and fear for Jim's life. Our church community rallied around us. I just remember the huge way that prayer lifted our, my spirits and gave us all hope. What an incredible joy and deep gratitude we felt at his miraculous homecoming in May of 2011. Jim returned home with a much deeper faith. He had prayed the rosary throughout his captivity and had been given scripture verses through a crack in an adjoining cell by a fellow Christian. He told us how close he felt to each of us through prayer. That was such a deep confirmation of the power of prayer and God's mercy. But Jim also returned with a deep resolve to continue working to give voice to the voiceless in Syria. When I tried to urge him to not go back to the conflict zone, he said, but mom, I found my vocation, my passion. I like to think that some of the seeds of faith were planted in Jim's childhood, but his faith and sense of social justice was surely strengthened at Marquette University, the Jesuit college he chose to attend in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. At Marquette, Jim was challenged to make a difference, to be a man for others. Previously, in our middle-class life at Rural New Hampshire, he'd never really seen real poverty. But in Milwaukee, he was exposed to some of the worst that bordered on their school and he was encouraged to go into the inner city and tutor. After graduation, he taught in the inner city of Phoenix, Arizona, through Teach for America for several years. 
Later, while in graduate school at UMass Amherst, he taught English to Wadwood Brothers in Holyoke, Mass. And later still in Chicago, he taught English and writing to Cook County boot camp felons um, in his free time. He was drawn to serve. Jim was a voracious reader and an interested writer, so it wasn't surprising he became a journalist. He had always been a good listener, always interested in your story, my story. We were initially very encouraged that he found a career that combined his interest in people with capturing their stories. He had been working in Syria since March of 2012 when he was kidnapped again on Thanksgiving Day of 2012. This time he vanished. We did not know if he was dead or alive. From the beginning, this kidnapping was totally different. There was no trace of Jim, and we never heard his voice again. My personal way of the cross had begun. My innocent, good-hearted Jim, taken at gunpoint, sold and held captive for being an American journalist. We were horrified that he was captured again, and terrified at his disappearance. No one knew who had captured him or where he was. We were grateful when an FBI agent came to visit and the media outlet offered it to fund a security team but the months went by with no presumption of Jim. <coughs> Finally, in the spring of 2013, I felt I just had to do something to help. So I quit my job as a nurse practitioner and began a series of trips to the FBI and the State Department in Washington, D.C., to New York, to the United Nations, to visit any ambassador who would talk to me, begging for help particularly the, you know, the ambassadors in that region, in Turkey and such. I went to anyone who would listen. I was repeatedly told by our government that Jim was their highest priority, and I trusted that. I felt like the persistent widow in Luke 18, 1 to 8, just reminding everyone that Jim was still missing. My trips made me feel useful, and my prayer kept me hopeful. But by September of 2013, Jim had still not been found. <clears throat> As a mother, I, I had a certainty that he was alive, and I kept praying that he would be strengthened by God through our prayers. And I would, would recall a hymn that was sung a lot in our church when Jim was growing up, Be Not Afraid, just hoping, just hoping that Jim would remember that God was with him amid this ordeal. It's in that same September of 2013, I was invited to do the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius in a nearby parish. It was serendipitous because I first had heard of those exercises many, many years before when Jim was a toddler in Chicago. I remember bringing two-year-old Jim to a meeting with a priest about the exercises and him telling me this was not the right time. Now, 39 years later, it was the perfect time. The weekly St. Ignatius prayer experience and spiritual direction sustained me during that time. Those exercises taught me and encouraged me to learn to stay quietly with God. I was reminded of God's continual presence and challenged to listen and to be still with God. Finally, in October of 2013, two former ISIS prisoners called to let us know that Jim was alive. He was alive in Aleppo prison in northern Syria. These men knew exactly where Jim was, and that news gave us so much hope. By the end of November, 
2013, we received our first email from Jim's captors with perfect answers to three proof of life questions that only Jim could have answered. We were convinced that these captor, captors had Jim, but they demanded an impossible ransom and the return of prisoners in exchange for Jim's freedom, none of which we could do. But at least we found Jim was alive, and the released hostages told us of the deep joy that those proof of life questions gave Jim. He knew we had found him. And then 30 days later, the captor emails abruptly stopped. So by December of 2013, it was a strange time because our youngest and only daughter, Katie, became engaged that Christmas. She refused to set a date for the wedding because she insisted on waiting for Jim's return. So on one hand, I was desperately trying to free Jim and on the other, I was trying to help our little girl plan her wedding. It was terror on one side and joy on the other. I was lifted up by the love and understanding from our Katie. Her joy gave me relief and hope. She was one of the many angels God sent me. I should tell you that in the spring of 2014, we also found out Jim was being held with 18 other European and British hostages as they were gradually released in 2014 each one of them took the time to reach out to us and reassure us that Jim was alive and strong I had the opportunity to meet with the freed Spanish hostages and eventually with the four French and other who were released, hoping to find some clue, some way to free Jim. These hostages told me what a source of hope Jim had been for them, always encouraging them that they were not forgotten. The released hostages shared with me how they passed the time giving lectures to each other, making up games, exercising together. Much of this is so well depicted in the documentary Jim, the James Foley story, which was actually done by a childhood friend of Jim's from Wolfboro. And I invite you to watch it. Um, it's really everywhere, Netflix and Amazon, YouTube. I thank God for putting Jim in the midst of such good men. The free hostage calls and kindness gave us also an unrealistic hope that our jail too might be freed. I assumed that our government uh, was in touch with everyone and I trusted that Jim was their highest one. The released hostages also spoke of Jim's devotion to prayer, how he used the five Muslim calls to prayer as his routine to pray, and how it helped him remain hopeful. I even, when I was traveling so desperately trying to figure out someone who could help me, I stumbled on a mass app um, so I could find a church anywhere. Um, to go anywhere in the world, and it just struck me, what a gift we have, our universal church, that I can go to a church in London or, you know, France or Washington, D.C., and find the Lord. I could have a place where I could be safe and know that God was with me. I often traveled alone, so it was such a solace, such a solace that God was with me. I eagerly read the Bible readings every day to keep hope for it. By May of 2014, we found out that Jim was being held by three other Americans. I, we hadn't known that because that information was kept from us. 
So what we discovered, there were other American families before American families came together in Washington to meet each other and ask our government for help. I hadn't gotten anywhere on my own, so we hoped we'd be stronger together. So we had several group meetings with the State Department, FBI, White House, hoping to be heard. However, by June of 2014, I became more and more aware that we were really on our own to get you out. We sought legal advice and started to raise pledges for the ransom demand. Much too late, though. Much, much too late. Also that June, the last European hostage, Daniel, a young man from Denmark, was released. He kindly memorized a letter from Jim to us. He memorized all those words because the captors wouldn't allow anyone go, it, them ever write anything. Um, and so he took the time to memorize Jim's words to us. And then called us within a day of his release to share. So just amazing goodness, you know, that he did that for us. He, Daniel spoke about how kind and generous Jim had been to him throughout his captivity and how he had consoled him. Daniel said, Jim was pure goodness, perhaps too good. Jim's letter through Daniel was such an answer to prayer because I knew for sure that God was very close to Jim because I knew he couldn't be that good without God. <laughs> I knew God was good. That summer of 2014, I, I went to Paris a second time to uh, desperately ask for advice from the newly released French hostages. I was so encouraged by their support and ideas until my husband called to say that we had received another email from Jim's captors threatening to kill him if the bombing in uh, the city it was not stopped. I was in total denial because I was just hopeful that the captors were in touch. I foolishly thought that if we offered the captors the money pledged by our generous friends, they would release him. I totally underestimated the hatred of Jim's captors. It was through long conversations with those men who had shared Jim's last year on earth that I came to understand a bit of how God had sustained Jim throughout the physical and mental torture and starvation of his nearly two year imprisonment. I was just so grateful that God had put them together. When I returned home in mid July, um, I remember I was just exhausted. I was just so exhausted. And I remember going to our Adoration Chapel and just falling on my knees and totally surrendering to God. I did not want to give up my will for Jim to come home to us. I really did not. I resisted. But I knew it was time. I knew in my heart that I had to surrender Jim. I didn't know what else to do. I so struggled to let him go, but I knew I had to entrust him to God. I felt a lingering fear that God might have a different plan for Jim than I, but I also felt a strange peace. I can't do it. I can't bring Jim home. And I, I just knew only God could take care of him. I was reassured in prayer that God would, in fact, set it free. It was two weeks later that Jim was brutally and publicly beheaded for being an American journalist and Christian. We had been warned by the captors. Oh, I was in such shock, such disbelief. And as the reality sunk in, I felt such a surge of anger Oh, I was so angry. I was so angry at our government and all those who had lied to me and refused to help. 
I felt such a horrible bitterness rising within me. I just struggled to catch my breath to accept what had happened to Jim. Lord, this is not what I meant when I said to Jim. Not at all. How could this be? I staggered under the weight of this loss. I really didn't know if I could go on. But I remember praying really hard not to be bitter and to pray for the grace to be forgiving and to be merciful. Well, it was then, it was then that the legions of angels descended upon us. First, it was our four remaining children and family to move home. They were in all parts of the world at that point. Then friends and colleagues came laden with food, warm hugs, flowers, plants, thousands of cards and gifts from all over the world poured into our mailbox. Our mail lady would leave us buckets of mail every day We received a 50-pound hand-carved wooden cross from Texas. Portraits of Jim, oils, pastels, drawings from children, hundreds of mass cards and rosaries. We received a call from our holiness, Pope Francis. I mean, and, and it, he had just suffered the loss of his own nephew and family member in a car crash. He called us. You know, this, all this love helped me to feel God's presence. And again, that peace that I felt when I first surrendered to him began to return. I knew God had set him free in the own he could no longer be starved or beaten anymore. He was truly free. And you know, the stations of the cross have been a huge solace for me. And I, I really, it was funny, when I was a four, four years ago, again, I was drawn to the stations. I, I just was. But the, you know, God in his goodness stoops to model for us how to endure our sufferings, how to walk in faith. Jesus was whipped and scourged, crowned with thorns. Like Jim, who was starved, tortured throughout his captivity. Like us, when we suffer losses, when our loved ones say sin or leave us, but Jesus is there to carry our heavy crosses. Like each of you, when you help shoulder someone else's burden, when you help someone else who's gone through both suffering. Look at the suffering in refugee camps in Afghanistan, hey, those who are, you know, starving, robbed of their homes. We have so much suffering. Here too, don't we? In our daily walk. You know, when the station Jesus meets his faithful mother, Mary's example of trusting in God helped me because she continued to walk in faith, even though she may not have understood why did her son, the Christ, need to suffer the way he did. It. She trusted. She walked in faith, which is what each of us is called to do. God sustained her and used her, our Mother Mary, as a model for us. Suffering truly touches all of us. And I feel like our Lord even models failure for us, which most all of us have experienced. I mean, he fell three times under the weight of the cross. Three times. Like so many of us, when our efforts fail, when I fail to bring Jim home, like so many of us, we try really hard and we pray for our children and for our loved ones and we come up short. 
just doesn't work out the way we hoped. But God is there. And God always hears and answers. When I feel tempted to give up the image of the Lord falling under the weight of our sins reveals to me how often we fail to love and are unselfish and arrogant. Jesus models to me the stripping away of clothing, dignity, and reputation, like Jim, when he was stripped of everything and treated like an animal. Like any of us, when we've been stripped of our family, or our jobs, or our home, or our loved one. And finally, Christ is crucified and dies for us. Like Jim, Jesus was finally free from his ordeal through his death. So the, the stations have been such a huge solace for me. And I, I would encourage you this Lent to embrace that beautiful tradition of ours because it, it taught me a lot and helped me so much. During these two years of Jim's captivity and murder, there have surely been moments of despair and discouragement. Um, but I've always had a deep abiding hope I believe Jesus submitted to all that suffering to give us that powerful example of how to walk in faith and hope in the midst of the worst circumstances of our life. To reassure us that he is with us in a very personal way. If he, we but ask, we've got to know this now. We've got to listen. It's still a struggle for me to slow down long enough to quiet myself. But the Lord has given me eyes to see him around me. And I'm sure you do, otherwise you wouldn't be here. God is all around us, isn't he? And the beauty, the physical beauty, the sunshine today, and look all of you good people who bothered to come out on a Monday night for a free. All signs of God's abiding love midst of our lives. God is active. He's alive. He's present. And we all have a choice when we suffer. You know, we can choose to be bitter, and that's understandable sometimes. I mean, it hurts. It hurts. You know, life hurts. And, um, but we also can choose to allow God to embrace us and to allow God to teach us how to forgive, how to stumble along, how to pick ourselves up, how to lift our heads up again. The choice is always ours. Our Lord will never force himself on us. But do we want to continue the cycle of vengeance and violence and hatred? Or do we want to pray for the grace to resist bitterness and seek mercy. As in Isaiah 61, 1 to 9, when he said, Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, and recovery of sight to the blind. The blind, that's us. The blind. Jim's sacrifice challenges me as an American. It just challenged me so much to care about this, the hundreds of innocent U.S. nationals who are taken hostage every day. Did you know that? Did you know right now there's 55 public cases of U.S. nationals, innocent people, innocent citizens, journalists, aid workers, businessmen, um, pastors, educators, who are just taken. You know, um, the taking of an American by other governments these days is um, quite a powerful thing to do, they found. You know, we have our citizens held in Russia, Egypt, Venezuela, Niger, Mali, Syria, Iran, Egypt. We have the whole list on the website. But I didn't know anything about that. I was totally clueless. 
that this hostage taking was even an issue, you know. Um, and I had no idea the risks journalists take to bring us uh, news from around the world. Jim would have wanted something positive to result from his death. And that's why we started the James Foley Legacy Foundation to advocate for all U.S. nationals taken hostage abroad and to promote journalist safety worldwide. We do that through undergraduate and graduate school curriculum so that brave Americans who choose to go out in the world, are, you know, know are shrewd and have um, the education to be aware of how to keep safe, as safe as possible in um, dangerous parts of the world. When Jim came home from his Libyan um, captivity, he, um, he was speaking at Marquette University, and he said that he aspired to be a man of moral courage. I didn't know that. <laughs> but that's what he said. He said he aspired to be a man of moral courage. And um, so that's why we at the Foley Foundation seek to inspire moral courage, one person at a time. I just feel like our country desperately needs it. Our families need it. We need it. And I believe that moral courage is really the life of Christ within each of us. It's his life that clarifies our path, that empowers us to be compassionate, to be committed and care about others. And it gives us the courage to try to put on love, where we may not feel like that, right? But with the Lord, we can. We can be empowered to do that. And our world often wants us to do the opposite really does. It wants us to do our own thing and not care. Our Lord is coming. Our world, and I feel like our families desperately need all of you to accept that invitation the Lord is, is calling out to you and to share it with your loved ones, to challenge them to be and make the difference in the to be the good in the world. It is that light of Christ within our families, within our churches, that's my hope for our world. Jesus lights the way. He's the lamp to our feet. If we but dare follow him. God challenges me every day. And I'm sure as a nurse, running a foundation has been a challenge. And I'm sure he challenges each of you. But please keep fanning that plant, that flame of faith and hope that the Lord has placed within your hearts and carry his light into the world. Our world needs you, needs Jesus so much. God bless you. And thank you for listening. And I'm open to any of your questions. I mean, I went through this rather quickly. It's been seven years. So um, if there's anything you didn't understand or want to just ask me, please do. I'd love to hear what you're interested in. Yeah, I just want to know what mistakes you feel that the government uh, Well, well, at that time, when Jim was in captivity, um, I think Jim was probably at the bottom of everyone's list. I mean, he was on the list. I mean, it was, they were kind to me. It's not that they weren't kind, but they weren't really truthful. <laughs> and, it, and there was no entity to help us. So there was no one's job to try to help bring in America. No. There was no one job. Can you imagine that? Yes. There was no one job. So since then, after all this horror happened, and Jim was the first of six murders that year, 
of people are Americans in captivity in 2014, 2015. He did do a president, a president Obama do a presidential policy directive which established a hostage fusion cell, an envoy whose job it is to help bring Americans home and a hostage recovery. So at least now we have a structure. So whose job it is to help. So that was part of the problem. It was no one's job. And you know, a lot of good people cared, but they had a million things coming at them. And you no know, one just told me. No. <laughs> no one just told me the truth. <laughs> and that was the truth at that moment in time. And, and again, you have to have a will to prioritize things. You know, our country has so many, let's face it, so many things going on. I'm talking about one person, right? One American. What I didn't know is that it was more than one, and there were four, four Americans in that particular captivity. And that every year there are hundreds of Americans that are taken home. But so part of the work of the foundation is to make that more of a priority. Work with the structure, and now we have a, a, the Levinson Act named for Robert Levinson, who was an FBI agent who was held captive for like 13 years and died in captivity. His family started that. So we're making progress, little steps. Yeah. What about the reaction of your children and the rest of your family when all of this happened? Were uh, they all, like you, reaching out for their faith? Or did some have given this one turn away? Um, well, that's an excellent question. Yeah. But everyone is, is different. Everyone is different. And, um, you can see how God has blessed me with a deep, with a deep faith in the time I was a child. That was just a gift. Um, so no, people, uh, our family is, um, I say, they're all very different. Uh, one of them is very involved in the foundation, our middle son, and the two youngest ones are, you know, will support me in the efforts. But as a whole, no, the family's not that involved in this is kind of my thing, because, um, but, and, and I think they have found their own ways of coping. Um, it was a big loss, because Jim was the older brother, who kind of often would bring everyone together. He was kind of that kind of a person. But, you know, I sadly, I would wish their faith had, you know, had been strengthened through it. But no, I wouldn't say that. Yes, you mentioned that there were four people held at, at one site. Well, there were actually 18, okay. but four Americans. Yeah, did the government ever indicate that they were attempting a rescue of Americans held at this site? You know what happened. They actually, when the four families went together to Washington, they actually threatened us. They told us we would be prosecuted if we ever tried to raise a ransom. They would never do a rescue, and that they would never ask a third country to help us. So that was repeated to us several times the end of 20, uh, spring of 2014. They did eventually do a rescue that we were unaware of in July, much too late after all the European hostages were released, and so the ones they knew they were going to kill, they just moved. But then they did, they, uh, did which was kind of strange because. Did, did they ever give you any reason why they, they were against trying to arrest you, uh, Americans? Well, um, it's not something that our, it's not usually a priority for our government, I found out. And that's partly why. You know, we started this foundation because I think the return of Americans who go out in the world, innocent Americans, you know, you know, doing good work should be a priority. But that's my my feeling, you know. But I was kind of appalled to find out it is not a priority. No, if they had been a soldier, it might have helped. But but if you know, thank God they consider you know when a soldier. Is in that situation, they're a higher priority, but not other citizens. So, 
That was appalling to me. And so, um, yeah, and so that's partly why, you know, we do the work of the foundation in AM, because I don't think that's right. I think our government should care, you know, when we need help with them. So, and, you know, that's fine. But, yes. Why were the Europeans released, but not the Americans? That's an excellent question. And that, that was because those governments chose to negotiate with the Catholics. Really? Mm -hmm. But see, our government wouldn't because the captors were considered terrorists, and we have a non-negotiation policy. So because of the policy, uh, we wouldn't engage. As a matter of fact, when the captors sent us emails, FBI couldn't help. It was up to our family to do it. So it was really appalling to me. <laughs> Frankly, because we didn't know what we were doing, you know, we really didn't. We uh, made a lot of mistakes that I just don't want other people to do, you know. So, but it's, um, that's our, been our policy. That's why also the, our foundation does research, uh, because that non-concessions um, policy does not um, prevent people from taking Americans. And if anything, Americans have worse outcomes um, often because of that policy, because we're not allowed to engage. We're not allowed to negotiate with the captors. But those are all you know, political questions. How about any other, anything else? I, I think one of the, please. Good question. You know, I really feel like the Lord protected us and prepared us. Because John and I struggled in our marriage. We did. We still do to some extent. You know, marriage should be a child. John and I are very different people. And, um, but we, by then, had gone to Retrovi, knew how to communicate, had a tool to communicate. Um, and we used that tool. We would dialogue daily. How do you feel? Day, you know, and, and really try to be conscious of how each other was feeling and, and whatever. Um, we also had just a lot of, a lot of love. That's how I, I call it, just love from strangers. You know, just a lot of, you know, to get a drawing from a child from Ireland or a, the big cross from Texas with Jim's name carved on it. You know, I mean, some people are so good. You know, just so caring. And we just didn't cook. I mean, people just brought us food. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, um, but, but it was, it was difficult. I think the other thing that was really helpful is Jim just had a really strong circle of friends. Jim had, was always kind of a, just kind of a lovable guy. And he just had friends from everywhere. And those friends rallied around us. I mean, within three weeks, his attorney friends had made us a nonprofit. I mean, we were ready to go. And they were on our board. And a lot of it, a lot of that was driven by Jim's friends who just loved Jim and wanted something good to bring some good out of the heart. Because they just knew Jim and they knew how much he was just such a good guy. He really was. And and they just knew that Jim would have wanted to inspire other people who were better. And certainly to push the government, our government, to be the best it could be, to be there for us. So it was really a lot of his friends, um, too. Um, by that time, they were attorneys and, you know, doctors and um, just wise people, they knew all kinds of stuff that I didn't know, and so they were really helpful, really helpful. Um, but, I, but I really think the love of all those people 
How's that stop? Literally, how's that stop? You know, one night it was um, it was like Jim was killed about six weeks before his birthday in October, and on the night of his birthday we came home, and somebody had put these tall candles. There were forty candles in our yard for Jim's birthday. I mean, just I mean, you know, people were just so sweet to us. They just cared. You know, and that, that one of the neighbors started a run, that's our annual run that we do in October now. So it's a coming together with kids and families and from all over the world and country where we run for freedom, you know, for American hostages, for our free press, you know, for the to celebrate the freedoms we have in this country. And beautiful things like that helped. You know, it, it gave us a, a channel for our grief to do something that was positive, something that was, because it's the children, I mean, the kids, the little guys, I mean, like, you know, from 18 months to, I mean, they were little, they didn't understand what was going They all, you know, Jim was in favor of young girl in school, you know, so, so all of that was, was helpful, you know. Um, but it was all comes down to the people just loving. A beautiful question. What was the date of his death? August 19th. It's the same day as our only granddaughter's birthday. Imagine that. Mm -hmm. But again, the you know the joy of Rory and the horror of losing Jim. But you know, were you able to get his body back? No. We have no, no idea. As a matter of fact, maybe right now there's a Two of the alleged British jihadists who um, tortured and killed Jim are um, being held in Washington and um, in Virginia, actually. And one of them um, pleaded guilty to all eight counts because he hopes to go back to the UK um, in 15 years, so he may. Um, but the other one is going on trial in um, January. And so we're hoping that we can learn some things from them. That's our hope, that maybe they can tell us where the remains are. But hundreds of thousands of people have been killed in Syria. I mean, this just, <clears throat> and Jim is with Jesus. I mean, I, to be honest, I don't really need his remains if you look for some of the things. I mean, it would be good in a way, I guess, but, um, I don't know, that's not, but, but accountability for, for the horror of those crimes is important, I think. So that I'm really thankful for. And our government has more than stepped up in that way. I mean, we have, now it's the opposite. We have the best of the Justice Department and, you know, prosecuting team, and, you know, so we will get some accountability. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you so much for your goodness. You've spoken very eloquently about the love that has sustained you and the faith that has sustained you. But just hearing your story, I read the forgiveness. And I would love to hear you talk more about how you found the power to forgive. And as, as part of your journey, that's that's a really good question, a really tough one. As a matter of fact, short, very, very shortly after this happened, well, not that shortly, it was probably a year, but it feels short, short to me. I was asked to speak at a Eucharistic conference, and they wanted me to talk about forgiveness. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I think forgiveness is challenging. Let's face it. I mean, it is. You know, but then we've got to re remind ourselves that we are forgiven you know, and that God is merciful to us. And when we're nasty or short or selfish or I'm arrogant or unloving, that, you know, a lot of people are good enough to forgive me. 
So I, I just think it's a process. And you know, some people, it's easier to forgive some people than others, right? If there's no remorse, it's hard. Um, you know, uh, a few weeks ago, we were in a courtroom in Virginia listening to um, Alexander Koti, one of the alleged um, you know, torturers of Jim, plead guilty to all these eight counts, you know. And he was just so nonchalant. Oh yeah, I did it, I did that, I found him there, I did this, I did that. Just totally, you know, just without any any remorse at all. And I look forward to, I, I hope I have an opportunity to just talk to him. Because I'm going to tell him I will pray for him. Because when I think about what his soul is you know, what it is, I just, I just can't imagine, you know. So, forgiveness is, you know, as you, you know, it's, to me, it, it's a process. And I, I certainly not all the way there. I need God to forgive. I need God, need to be reminded that I'm a sinner and I want to forgive. I need mercy and forgiveness, and that we all do feel, you know. Um, but it requires, uh, to me, it's, it's a God-like trait. <laughs> you know, it's of God, not, not we, we people, we human beings, and it's kind of not our gut reaction, is it, you know? So, but that's a beautiful because I think in many ways that it's at the heart of a lot of our struggles as Christians, right? You know, to, to you know, we all hurt each other. That's in life, you know, none of us are perfect. So it's it's having that, asking God to help us to be forgiving and merciful. It's beautiful. Thank you very much. Would you like to take more questions? Well, I'll do whatever if you have questions. You mentioned that Jane had as a maze and a bunch of nephews. How did you go to your pain, answer their questions throughout his absence and since his death? Well, you know, they didn't, you know, a lot of the parents, I was the grandmother, so it was a lot of their parents who were dealing with um, most likely their questions. I mostly just hugged them, loved them. <laughs> you know, I just love little ones, and um, they were pretty quiet, you know, um, and, but, you know, they were just so aware. Um, my little granddaughter said it all, she was four, and she just said, me, I'm heartbroken, <laughs> you know, and they, you know, they, they're just amazing, you know. But again, it's it's the healing of love. Right? That's the only thing that counters such a Ability to be here in front of all of us. But since this has happened, have you ever had like little boundaries where you feel Jim around? Or have I have, have you ever like felt him uh -huh. here with you? Or or you say, oh, that must be Jim or something? Um, you sometimes they're called bot wings. Well, you know it's funny. I I feel I feel the closest to Jim when I pray. There's no question about that. That's when I feel Jim's closest. Um, there have been a lot of people who said they felt Jim's presence. I, I haven't as much, if, except in prayer. And I, it's in prayer that I meet Jim. You know, it just is. And, um, but it's interesting, other people have had dreams or, you know, uh, felt his presence. Sometimes I get kind of jealous about that. Jeez, I'd like to, you know. <laughs> Um, but I have it so. And I, I just 
see. But the connection through both captivities of the jail was through prayer. And that's life cycle. And I think it's a place we can all meet our loved ones. You know, what we lost them. Just in trusting to God. Do you feel like you are a, um, a person who always was a person of deep faith, even before the ordeal to help you to get through it, or did the ordeal deepen your faith and help you to go? Well, you know, I was always kind of drawn to God. It was kind of, I think it was my father's fault. He told me I had to choose what faith to, you know, uh, what faith to follow. And it kind of intrigued me. It was kind of interesting. He kind of interested. Uh, what's the difference between the Unitarian Church and the Catholic Church? And what, what, you know, it just kind of intrigued me. So I was blessed kind of with an extra drawing, kind of, to be honest. But I was pretty clueless. I mean, I didn't know that it was the Holy Spirit or anything like that. And I was pretty negligent of the call in a lot of ways. But God has been good to me. I mean, I, with the people God put in my life, so incredible grace. The power of a holy priesthood, as I was telling Father Suarez, is huge. You know, God has, has put some very holy men holy priests, holy women in my life. And, and that's who all of you can be for others. And I really believe that. That is so important. I really need you desperately. But no, I don't, um, I really feel the Lord prepared me for the other. Because I had been doing the Stations of the Cross and the Rosary before and more and more as I get older and came to um, know God better. And then that sustained me during the, the horror of it all. But, you know, everyone's different. You know, I mean, different people grow at different times, but for me, that's very Does your husband support you with your foundation work? Is he involved with the foundation? Sort of, some days. It depends. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> you know, it, he tries to. He really does. I mean, John tries to. I, I, I know he thinks I'm busier than he'd like me. Um, it, it is a rather challenging, you know, with our busy family and the Stanford Foundation and everything. It's been busy. But, you know, um, he does try to support me. And I, we recently. Do any of you know, I've read anything by Matthew Kelly? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Well, I enjoy him, especially some of his books. And, and I like the way he talks about becoming the best version of ourselves. And so John and I talk about that, you know, in how, how can we as a couple encourage each other to become the best version of ourselves? And this is something I feel called to do. And he understands that. Does he still work as a doctor? No, he's retired. We're old. <laughs> we live in Wolf Park, Hampshire, that tiny little town. Well, thank you. Yes. Your personal journey is certainly very spiritually uh, uplifting and touching and a great grace. My question would be, have you encountered individuals who find it a mockery or laugh at you and ignore your sense of forgiveness and speak very negatively about the faith that you're professing? And how do you encounter that? Oh, yeah, right in our field. <laughs> so, uh, the family, right within our family, John struggled in faith. John really has. My husband has. And so, you know, when one parent struggles and one parent's drawn, you know, the family kind of struggles. And at least that's been my experience. So, absolutely. And, yeah. And uh, it's not, you know, some of our children go to church, some of them will, some won't, you know, kind of thing. And, oh, mom. 
So, you know, I mean, there was a lot of that when the kids were growing up. Um, now, you know, I, I, they respect me more now that they're older and adults, but, but they, they've struggled in faith. And, um, but when the children were younger, uh, I had to struggle a lot as a mother because my husband really wasn't big on the faith. And, you know, sometimes he'd come with us, sometimes not. That's hard with kids. They feel all that. You know, they feel the, you know, and, um, and maybe, maybe they would struggle anyway. But, um, yeah, and, and there have been times when I was younger that, yes, that was the case. But not as now it doesn't bother me. Not at all. Because I know I forgive. I'm so grateful for it. You know, I just pray for that. You know, I just, but as a child, it bothered me. You know, and as a young mother, you know, I kind of felt kind of stupid sometimes trying to, Always trying to encourage the kids to, you know, to pray and to. I was always big on doing things at home and they can't even read and all that stuff to try to encourage the kids to pray. And, um, but I think I think all of them have some seeds of faith, and that's what I can keep praying for them. You know, and, and I think when Jim really needed it, he was able to tap into something. But yeah, it's challenging in this world. You're so right, sister. I mean, I think it can be challenging. And that's why I think as church communities, we need to build community around kids and families to help them have the strength to model that, that it's cool to believe in God. That's why we need strong men and women. The kids need to see you and your faith and your, um, what it, believe in God, the strength it gives you. To live, to forgive, to do what you do every day. Kids need to see that. 